makes me so happy to hear that you're using it as a reference, that it's easy to go through. That was really the goal, that it's the kind of thing you can come back to time and again, whenever you're feeling stuck, whenever you have a new campaign, a new initiative, a new product, a new service, and let this inform the way you think about content. Because once you do that, it really becomes second nature. Today, right and wrong content marketing creation methods and six steps that'll help you get clients now and increase your profits in 2021. I'm Ken Newhouse. Building a profitable business isn't only about generating leads and driving sales. It's about who we are and what we're made of. It's about finding the most effective methods to persuade, inspire, and ignite the imagination of others so you can succeed in business. If you're a member of the new breed of entrepreneur, I invite you to join the quest as we reveal the newest and most effective methods you can use to get clients now. You know, on any given day of the week, an average of more than 500,000 new websites are created, thousands of hours of video are uploaded onto YouTube each minute, tens of thousands of tweets are sent out each second. It's crazy. And there are more than 750,000 podcasts, most releasing a new episode every single week. And the result of this ever-growing content explosion? Content consumption has become more audience-led. You can't possibly consume it all, so you have to hone your expectations, you have to raise your standards, and you have to make tougher choices about where you invest your time. And the prospects you're targeting, pay attention, this is very, very important, the prospects you target as new clients, they're doing the same. You know, amid the tsunami of content online today, it's become increasingly difficult to attract and hold the attention of your perfect prospects and clients. And as a result, the pressure you face when creating content and impactful stories is greater than it's ever been. If you want content marketing to work for you, you have to create content compelling and differentiated enough to rise to the top of an increasingly crowded content landscape. And if you're like me and my most successful clients, each new social platform that launches or each new content format that, you know, quote unquote, catches on is an overwhelming reminder of work that has to be done. More and differentiated work in the form of, again, higher quality content that you're increasingly hungry and most of the time fickle prospects are demanding. You know this to be true. And as a result, the engine in your creative mind races, oftentimes to the point where it feels like it's going to explode as it wonders, where am I going to get ideas for my content? And like every coach, consultant, entrepreneur, and professional on the planet, you've been conditioned through a variety of ancient myths, modern movie plot lines, and dramatic entrepreneur quote-unquote origin stories to believe that creativity and inspiration are either innate or random strokes of chance, of luck. You know, it's ironic, but it seems like some people are just born with a talent to create awesome content. For those folks, the ones lucky enough to come into the world with special creative ability, their ideas seem to flow freely, effortlessly. As an example, they effortlessly and easily and consistently introduce radical new concepts, revolutionary new products. They disrupt entire industries and often change the way the marketplace thinks. Think of people like Steve Jobs, people that are labeled creative geniuses, put on a pedestal and admired by all. For others, great ideas seem to come as a stroke of luck, as I mentioned before. Things, people, or even circumstances seem to line up perfectly for these people, which allows them to make a discovery or use an object in an entirely new and effective way. And amidst all of this, one of the biggest mistakes you and I can make is when you allow yourself to see idea generation as innate or random as something people are either born with or something they fall into by a quote-unquote stroke of luck. Framing reality this way, listen, this is really important. Framing reality this way is going to hamstring your ability to make a meaningful mark in the creative process. Again, if you're like me, you've probably told yourself, you know, I just don't have it, or I've got to keep waiting for that, you know, quote unquote, big idea to come to me someday, if it ever happens. The reality of the situation, however, and this actually is something that should excite you, it excites me, is that anyone can create content ideas quickly and easily if, and this is a big if, if they have the right framework. And that's what you're about to discover during today's conversation. I'm Ken Newhouse, and today is episode 389 of the Get Clients Now podcast, my guest today is Melanie Diesel, best-selling author of the Content Fuel Framework, the top-selling content marketing book on Amazon for all of 2020. Listen to what I just said. The top-selling, as in sold the most copies, content marketing book on the entire Amazon.com platform in the year 2020. That is a tremendous, tremendous accomplishment, especially when you consider the fact that Diesel is barely 30 years old. During today's conversation, Diesel's going to reveal her very own time-tested framework for thinking of content ideas, 
a hundred or more content ideas at a time. And in fact, she's going to give you a handy list of subcategories that you can use to guide your brainstorms, no matter what type of content you want to create. Her framework is the codification of a process she's used for more than 15 years, generating hundreds of thousands of unique content ideas for nearly endless platforms and purposes. Diesel used this framework as an example to present Fresh Idea to the hundreds of brands requesting content campaigns when she worked as the first editor of branded content at the New York Times. And while I don't agree with most of the things that are written in the New York Times, it's still an amazing accomplishment. Diesel also used a framework to maintain a pace of six articles per month when she had a column on Inc.com, another amazing accomplishment. She used it to populate personal blogs, company YouTube profiles, startup marketing plans, and more with engaging original content. But this framework isn't one that only works for her. Diesel has helped thousands of people adopt this framework as their own in workshops, through conference keynotes, and during employee training sessions. By the end of my conversation today with Diesel, you're going to have a notebook full of content ideas and a newfound confidence in your ability to come up with new, exciting, and effective content ideas quickly and easily. By the end of today's episode, coming up with 100 content ideas, it's going to seem like a walk in the park. And so with that, let's go ahead and welcome my guest, Melanie Diesel, onto the show. So Melanie, on behalf of myself and the members of the Get Clients Now Nation, I want to welcome you to the show today. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. Hanging in there as we all are, right? Trying to hang in there as we all are. Now, you were in New York City. Now you're down in Raleigh, correct? You kind of picked up shop and moved everybody down with you? Yeah. So mid uh, midway through lockdown in the early stages, at least for us in New York, it was around June, it became really clear that our home situation was not set up for long-term two adults working from home and a, and a baby toddling around. So we, uh, we, we decided we were going to mix it up, get somewhere with more space and closer to nature and just get us more suited to a uh, potentially long-term staying home all by ourselves. <laughs> I think most of our listeners are probably familiar with your work. I mean, it's prolific. You've got just a tremendous, as I covered in the introduction, your bio, you've got a tremendous, tremendous list of accomplishments. But if you could take a minute or two, give us your backstory, kind of bring us up to speed of, you know, where you started from, some of the experiences you had, bring us up to the point of, hey, I wrote this awesome book that's got a ton of rave reviews on Amazon. So my listener can kind of get a, you know, a good reference or a good starting point to begin the interview. Definitely. Well, I always say that uh, I've been a storyteller since the beginning, you know, as long as I could remember. Um, that's taken a couple different forms. So when I uh, when I was in school, I was, you know, a part of the literary magazine and the school newspaper and on the yearbook committee. I mean, if we were creating stuff, I wanted to be a part of it. Uh, and that kind of continued throughout the rest of my schooling career. I mean, I was the editor uh, in chief of my college newspaper. And I, I just sort of realized that, like, I want to be out there telling stories. So I studied journalism. I thought that I would go into, you know, the exciting world of, you know, the old school journalism I studied. And, you know, I'd be putting feet to pavement and uncovering injustice and, you know, all those things we, we like to imagine we're doing. In reality, I graduated into a world where journalism was, you know, dramatically downsizing. They were shifting to digital. There were a lot of layoffs. And there just weren't the kind of jobs that, you know, I had been trained to do. I mean, I joke with people, I took a full three credit course in print newspaper layout and design, which, you know, is not something that, that the average journalist needs these days. So, you know, I wasn't exactly ready to move into that field and there weren't the kind of jobs that, that I was looking for. So I had to figure out what am I going to do with this skill set and this love of storytelling when I can't end up in a newsroom like I wanted. And that's how I kind of took this, what ended up being a lifelong detour into the world of content marketing. And so taking those skills, I work with marketers and creators to help them apply the best practices of journalism to their storytelling, to their content creation, uh, in hopes of helping make it more compelling, more credible, and get them the results that they're looking for. So I started at the Huffington Post with uh, a brand storytelling team called HuffPost Partner Studio. Essentially, I was on staff for any time a brand wanted to work with us and wanted to tell some brand stories that I would help them figure out what our audience might be interested in. So tangible example, uh, you know, General Mills comes to us and they want to appeal to the HuffPost audience. And I would coach them through coming up with recipes to live in the HuffPost food section that happened to include you know, you'll play yogurt as an ingredient, things like that. Uh, and then I went over to the New York Times. They hired me as their first ever editor of branded content. The first full-time hire there and kind of really it was nice for me because I could get closer to those journalistic roots, like the kind of content that we were creating with brand partners there was much closer to the stuff that I fell in love with in the first place. So it's a really awesome experience there to do some awesome hard-hitting, almost investigative type sponsored content. 
I worked at Time Inc. for a little while as the director of creative strategy. And Time Inc., as you may know, has already been, has since been, uh, you know, chopped up and, and sold off to different entities. So a lot of the work we did there has since been, uh, you know, upended. But I have been really privileged to spend the last six years or so running my own firm, Story Fuel. And basically my, my job, as I've seen it, is to teach and reach as many people as possible with these best practices, kind of help them fall in love with the journalistic way of operating that I love, you know, and teach them how to do the same. So that's taken the form of all kinds of things, you know, speaking at conferences, doing corporate workshops, running masterminds. And then, you know, most recently uh, writing this book, my goal was really to create something that was more accessible so that someone who, you know, may not get to see me on stage at a conference or, you know, bring me in to, to do a workshop for their employees, that those kind of folks could still learn and still benefit from the stuff that I'm sharing. So let me just ask you a couple of questions. First, a quick comment. You know, you mentioned working at the newspaper. When I first started learning direct response and marketing and things like that, I did a lot of lead generation stuff. I began with newspapers. And from there, I moved to infomercials. And those are almost things that are like non-existent as far as, you know, people who are in my line of work, small business owners, coaches, consultants, even dentists don't typically advertise anymore in the newspaper. It is definitely smaller. The one thing I will say is that the folks who are print readers tend to be some of the most loyal and engaged. So just as an example, that the college paper, I mean, I know it sounds like, oh, yeah, I was the editor of my college paper, like this rinky dink little thing. But we were a daily newspaper and we had 9000 daily circulation. So, you know, we had a staff of 250 half million dollar budget. We were a legitimate uh, enterprise, you know. And uh, yeah, I mean, we polled our students all the time and overwhelmingly folks wanted the print and they were so deeply engaged with it. And we see the same trends, especially in local markets. So if you've got a local newspaper promise you the people who are reading that, even if the circulation is small, it is targeted. They read every page. They cut out articles and put them on the fridge. They are definitely some of the more engaged audience, even if they're they're shrinking in size. Yeah. And so the other comment I was going to make is that, you know, you mentioned working at time and then it got chopped up and kind of disassembled and stuff. And it made me think of my favorite movie, one of my favorite movies of all time. I know it was a different magazine and that was Walter Mitty. The I've story not of the, seen it. As a journalist, you have to see it's like the, one of the best movies. I probably have watched that movie 10 times. I'm not kidding. It's on the list, but I'll elevate it. I'll, I'll boost it up the list. All right. So you're big on producing high quality content as a mechanism, as a vehicle for bringing targeted, high quality, high value prospects into a person's business. And so what I want to know from my listeners point of view is how does a person from like a 30,000 foot view, and then we're going to start to peel the onion. We'll start to get a little deeper in this as we go. But What's like the big overarching principle or message that my listener has to know about the importance of creating quality content consistently across a wide variety of mediums and formats and things like that? And obviously, like I said, we're going to dive into that as we get going. Yeah, I mean, the one thing that's really different, and again, you know, coming back to my journalism roots, the thing that I'm always sharing is there's a real difference in perspective uh, in terms of how and why we create content between the way journalists do it and the way most marketers do it. And that difference can make a huge difference for you and your business. So most of us on the marketing side, our instinct is, what do I want to tell my audience? What do I want them to know? And that's really the mindset, the approach we take. Whereas in journalism, it's the inverse. It's what does my audience need to know? What does my audience want to know? So it's really audience first. And so I really encourage you to kind of flip that switch because when we put our audience first, when we're asking, what do they need to know? How can I help them? What kind of content would be valuable for them? Really helps us hone in on the kind of content that's going to get deeper engagement that they're going to be more likely to be searching for and the kind of stuff they're actually excited to engage with. And I think for most of us as consumers of content in our lives, very few of us wake up and say, man, I cannot wait to read the branded email that came in overnight. Like we just don't think that way. But when we put on our marketing hat, we forget. And so it's really helpful to kind of practice that perspective, you know, putting your audience first, what do they need? What do they want? What would be helpful for them? Letting that guide your content strategy often creates much better results. I do think, and I want to get your feedback on this quickly, a couple points. Storytelling is critically important. And this is actually a question I'll ask you later. It's something that's why I've had probably a dozen different storytellers on the show, people who publish books on storytelling, because I wanted to make my copywriting better. And it has. So I want to get your thoughts on the importance of learning how to tell stories. And then you also mentioned telling our listeners or telling our prospects what they 
need to know and what they want to know. And I think from my perspective, and this is where I want to get your feedback, I think a lot of business owners make the mistake of telling their audience, their prospects, what they think they want to know because they haven't done their research. When in reality, it's what the marketer or the business owner wants them to know about their product, service, business, whatever it is. And I'm going to get your feedback on that. Yeah, 100%. That's the exact mindset shift that we're hoping to achieve here is that exactly in so many instances, well, what do I want them to know about the product? What do I want to you know, tell them about our upcoming promotion? You know, What's important for my boss to see that I'm talking about out in the marketplace? Whereas oftentimes our audience's needs and the content they engage with, share and value, it's very different from that. So it is important to your point to do some sort of, you know, reconnaissance, whether that's, you know, keyword research, whether it's a focus group, a survey, you know, talking face to face, if you have that opportunity to do so and just asking, you know, what questions do you have? I mean, one of the the best things I always recommend folks do is talk to whoever's on the front line with your audience. And that might be your sales team. It might be your customer service team. It might be your store clerks who are, you know, out there, your sales folks. And it could be your social team who are answering the questions that come in through direct message and replies and comments. They're going to know exactly what your audience is wondering about, exactly what they misunderstand, exactly what they you know, routinely have to give more information about. And so if you can focus on those kinds of things, you'll make sure you're getting to their actual needs and not the needs you think they have or wish they had. So let me do this. Let me read Ann Hanley's. I want to get it correct. This is an endorsement she wrote in your book. And I have to say... I don't know that I've seen a book with so many endorsements. It took me 15 minutes to get through them all. And these are heavy hitters who gave them to you. Anyway, having said, here's Ann's quote. It says, business owners don't need another content marketing book, but we do need a practical, accessible, ridiculously useful guide to reimagining our great ideas in a hundred different ways. And in parentheses, literally. Here's my question. How did you come up with the framework that you outline in the book? And what inspired you? What was the genesis or what lit the fire for you to say, hey, you know what? I got this pretty cool framework. I need to write a book. This will help people. Yeah. So, you know, all of it is uh, accidentally. And I try my best in in all things in life to embrace the unexpected gifts. This was all born out of a conference that I was speaking at, I think back in 2016 or 17. I was supposed to be speaking there. I had a totally different topic that I was meant to present as a keynote. And I got the unfortunate news that a fellow speaker wasn't going to be able to make it at the very last moment. And so they asked me like, hey, you know, we're familiar with you. We've worked with you before. Do you have something else for us? You got like something that you've been thinking about doing? You could maybe spin up for this open slot. And uh, because I had presented there before, they had already seen all of my existing stuff. So I had to come up with something new. And I had been thinking through this framework, but it didn't have the name it does now. It didn't look quite like it did now, but sort of the, the seeds of it were there. So urgency forced me to sort of spend an entire international flight and a, you know, a couple nights in the hotel kind of fleshing this out as best I could and present it there just on opportunity. I mean, I had like 48 hours notice. So what I found is after that event, I got way more response, feedback, emails, social engagement about that topic that I had spun up and not fully thought out, you know, at the very last minute than the one that I had planned and rehearsed and was super excited, you know, and and hired to come in and give. And so that was the first instance where I realized, like, I think there's something more here. I think it's worth spending some more time on this. People were emailing me to ask, do you have resources? Is there an ebook? Do you have, you know, they wanted more, they wanted materials to support that knowledge. So that was sort of the, the first instinct where I thought, I think there's something here that could be something bigger. I don't think I realized it was a book quite yet, but From that point, I really started spending more and more time thinking about how I could rename it, how I could organize it, how I could make it more accessible. Because, you know, in the book, if you engage with it, you'll see there's some very clear categories and lists of items. And I'll tell you that it wasn't always so organized. uh, And those titles weren't always correct. Like they were not the exact right names for some of these things. And so it took a little bit of time and experimenting to make it feel right. I had the privilege of presenting a more polished version of it Uh, at another conference in uh, 2018. And that point, I felt like, okay, it's finally there. It's clicked. It's ready. It feels good. The response is good. And again, I kept getting requests for materials. So I thought this might be for a book. I think it's time here. So I sort of workshopped it into a book, if that makes sense. By the time I presented the, the book manuscript, the IP already existed. I mean, I had already presented it. I already knew what it was. 
So the actual book writing process was very easy because I knew what was in the book. I just had to get it out of my head uh, and, and into a manuscript. So it was definitely a, definitely exciting, but it was a long, slow, uh, almost unintentional process. That's kind of backdooring it. Usually it's the other way around, but uh, that's interesting. So from let's move a little lower. You know, we started at the 30,000 foot view, but let's drop down to 10,000 foot view. If I want to start attracting not only super high quality people to see my business, to want to know more about my business through the use of content, but also more of them, what are a couple different principles from a baseline, a foundation that I have to start from if I want to start moving in that direction? So one of the things that I always recommend, especially if you're starting out, uh, is that one of the easiest places to kind of sprinkle storytelling into your existing processes is to take whatever you have that is some version of a testimonial, a case study, a customer story, take whatever that is and really dial it up in terms of the you know the narrative. So instead of just having a, a quote and a name and leaving it at that, well, why don't you interview that person? Why don't you talk to them at length, find out what was that stake for them making that decision? What things did they try before they worked with you and found that solution? How important was it to them to find that solution? You know, turn it into more of a story. That's often a really easy place to start. First off, because we're doing it already and we already see the value of this. So it seems to make sense to invest in it more. So that's always a good first place to start. You'll start to see the deeper engagement with that. That's a, a step one, I would say. Step two, I mean, I would say, if you want to kind of continue to go deeper, my recommendation is to look at the sort of basic reference type material that people look for when they're going to engage with a business like yours or, or get a service or product like yours. So that could be definitions of, of key terms. It could be helping them out with questions to ask. It could be different options that are available that you want to walk through and, and help them decide. Any of that sort of basic explanatory content now, the reality is, and I get this question all the time, no, it will not be the most differentiated, special, unique content out there. But if your audience is looking for it, it's much better for them to find it from you than to find it from your competition. So that's a really good place to start. There's very little sense of urgency. You can do it at your own pace, sort of in the background. Just sort of build up that base of all the informational content that's going to be helpful for your audience to ultimately be more informed when they become a customer and ultimately help them feel more prepared to engage in business with you. So it's a really good foundational place to start. So well, let me just throw a question in here. I got to get to it now because you keep saying the word. And this is a word that I think is critically important. It's not a word. It's a skill set. It's an ability to producing high quality content. And it's, I don't know that you really covered it in great detail in the book, but I just want to get like a 10 second answer from you. Storytelling. We have to be able to tell stories because that's how we slip past the I've termed it the sales prevention firewall. That's one of the tools we can get our marketing message into the subconscious of our prospects by telling stories. Their guard is dropped. Everybody loves a story. You know, it's just built into our DNA. What are one or two things a person can do, read, study to become a better storyteller? And this is kind of off track of the interview, but just real quick, I want to get this because you, I know, are an awesome storyteller. I mean, I think there, this is really good advice. I think there's a lot of different structures you can use. You know, my framework is specifically for coming up with ideas. But if you are looking for more guidance on the actual uh, creation and delivery of stories, if you're looking for some inspiration there, one resource to check out would be the Donald Miller's book, Building a Story Brand. So that's really helpful if you're trying to figure out your holistic brand story, not maybe an individual piece of content, but who you are as a brand. That's a really helpful resource. Another one I rec recommend is Anne Hanley's book, uh, Everybody Writes, is really good if you're particularly working on written content. And Kendra Hall has a, has a fairly recent book called Stories That Stick. And that's going to be a really good resource for finding out what makes the story compelling. My advice is always to bring in people because I think people often guide a story for us. So whether that's interviewing sources or experts or customers or clients, when you talk to people, stories naturally happen. It's our natural way of communicating. So if for every piece of content you create or as many as is realistic, try to talk to one or more people, I think you'll find that the story kind of surfaces on its own, that it becomes clear where the rising action is and where the, you know, where the conflict is, you know, those, those elements that we see in the stories that we love kind of becomes clear through conversation. So always try to bring in faces and voices as best you can, and, and you'll find those stories start to uncover themselves. You know, I appreciate the fact that you mentioned those are all good books. I've read them. But let me just interject this. A couple different things. First and foremost, 
you got to have a framework from which to work before you can even start to think about storytelling, which is why I've got Melanie on the show today, because her framework, it's literally just add water, hold you by the hand, walk you down the path, fill in the blanks, whatever you want, you know, connect the dots, whatever you want to say. It's that simple. The book really isn't that long. You know, when I first I bought it on Kindle, I'm thinking this is going to be just huge, you know, this big volume, this manual. It's really quick to read and it's a great resource just to flip to and, and you know, dive in and get ideas from immediately. So I love the fact that you put it together that way. Something else I want to do again real quick. I don't have an affiliate relationship with you. I get nothing out of guaranteeing your book. But as with every guest on my show, invest in Melanie's book, use it. You'll be thrilled with the results you get. If you can't say that for any reason, email me at customer service at kennewhouse.com. I will buy the book from you. No questions asked. This is a worthy investment of not only your money, but your time. And I know you can always get more clients. You can always make more money, but you can't get more time. And so I'm very cautious and respectful of the fact that we can't get more time. I'm respectful of your time. And as a result of that, I don't take recommendations that I make lightly. I consider them very seriously before I make them. This is a book you can trust and invest in. I think, again, it's a wise investment to that. I'm going to do this. I'm going to read another quote from the book, but this is a quote that you made in the book. Then I have three important questions I want to ask as it relates to this. Now, you said in your workshops and executive coaching sessions, here's a question that you typically ask people. How long would it take you to come up with a hundred content ideas for your brand or company? And from what I understand, the answer is what? Uh, A lot of times the answer is, I don't know, I can't, or it would take weeks or it would take months. I mean, it's always this large and or impossible volume of time. Yeah, the jaw drops and hits the floor. But let me ask you this question then, the follow up. Why is it critically important that a person could literally this fast be able to pump out a hundred content ideas for their business, their brand? Well, there's a couple of reasons. I mean, the one thing I always stress to people is you're not going to make all of these ideas, right? That's not, that's not the goal here. We're not trying to turn you into a content factory or a farm. The idea is in way too many cases, we are relying on really old or outdated or played out ideas of what our content should be. And we feel stuck. We start creating the same thing with a slight variation. It's not interesting to us. It's not interesting to our audience and it's not getting us results. So it's really important that you can train your brain to think differently so that you're drawing on different inspiration. You're considering new perspectives. You're keeping things fresh because that's going to be the way to keep your audience engaged. The other thing that's really important here is I think that so often uh, I meet people who think that they are not creative or I'm not a content person. And the reality is we are all capable of that level of creative thinking. And, and it's really just a matter of having a system to activate it because every other part of our business, of our organization, of our marketing is systemized, right? There's, we have measures, we have goals, there's time limits. It's all very organized. It's all part of a system. Sometimes we're paying monthly thousands or tens of do- thousands of dollars for systems to organize all these other parts of our business. So why not have a system that allows you to optimize and be more productive in coming up with your content ideas. To me, it just seems like a no-brainer that we should treat it with the same level uh, of care and attention to make sure we're being as efficient as possible. Yeah, and the fact that you put it in a book that's like, I don't know, 10 or 15 bucks, I think probably like 10 bucks, maybe even less, I don't know. It's insane. The value you get for the money, the ROI on this is insanity. So let's take a look at the formula. I'm gonna ask you a question. So it's content equals focus plus format. So what I'd like you to do from a 30,000 foot view, then we're going to start to dive in after we talk about the other half of the formula. From a 30,000 foot view, let's first talk about, because you gave 10 different elements of focus and you gave 10 different elements or examples of format. But let's first, from a 30,000 foot view, talk about the importance of focus as it relates to creating killer content that is magnetically attractable and irresistible to the people we want in our business giving us money. 100%. So focus is really the perspective, the lens through which you're going to tell your story. Now, the instinct for most of us, we're probably most familiar with product-focused content, meaning that the purpose of the content we're creating is to focus on our product, right? That's probably what comes most natural to most of us who are in any sort of sales or marketing role. However, uh, there are a lot of different approaches you can take that still serve your broader business goals. A lot of other focuses you can use to, again, as we talked about before, tell a story that's approaching it from a different angle. So you're not putting out the same tired things all the time. So yeah, like you said, in the book, we run through 10 different options for you. The idea being that, yes, some of these will resonate with you. Some may not. Some may be easy for your specific type of business. Some may be more of a challenge. 
But the idea is to give you a checklist to run through so that you don't end up, you know, saying, well, I guess we'll just profile another client or I guess we'll just do another photo shoot of our product on a white background. You know, you're getting some inspiration to approach your stories in different ways. We're going to dive into format here in just a second, but, you know, someone might make the mistake of thinking, well, she's got 10 different examples of focus and 10 different examples of format. So that really 10 times 10, that gives me 100 different ways to produce content. It's more like 10 cubed are your options here with this because of the way it's like she's giving you these puzzle pieces and all you have to do is pick one up here and pick another one up from another pile and they fit together seamlessly and perfectly, which I don't know how you did it, but uh, it's like those rings, you know, you're trying to figure out how to get them apart or put them back together. And then somebody comes up and just boom, that's what you have in this book. And the thing is, I think, you know, sometimes people say, well, what if I do those content ideas? Then do I need like a different book or another format? And absolutely not. The idea is that every individual brainstorm for every individual piece of content, you can use this framework. So this is not just going to give you 100 ideas and that's it. This is you've got a new product coming out in two months. You want to brainstorm ways to tell the story of that specific product launch. Here are at least 100 ways for you to talk about that specific product launch. So if you're using this as a way to organize your brainstorms, organize your content idea generation, you're going to be creating content ideas all the time. And the idea makes me so happy to hear that you're using it as a reference, that it's easy to go through. That was really the goal, that it's the kind of thing you can come back to time and again, whenever you're feeling stuck, whenever you have a new campaign, a new initiative, a new product, a new service, and let this inform the way you think about content. Because once you do that, it really becomes second nature. And and that's what I'm going for. You know, it's ironic that the fact that, you know, the primary thing I do besides podcasting is I'm a direct response copywriter. And so for me, writing is something that I do naturally. But when it comes to content production, which is different from drafting and writing a sales letter or a piece of sales copy or an ad or something like that, creating content, I think I probably wasted more time trying to come up with the format and what I wanted to focus on than I did actually writing it once I made the decision. So the fact that you've given me a tool that allows me very, very quickly to come up with the ideas that I have choose the best one, that allows me to get into the meat of what I do and do well and do it very quickly. And so just the fact that it's saving me so much time and really mental anguish, you know, sitting over a blank piece of paper or a blank Word document or, you know, whatever. So from a 30,000 foot view, you got 10 elements of format. My personal favorite in there, even though I, again, I'm a direct response copywriter, is the audio because obviously I'm a podcaster, but you've given a whole bunch of different ones. But Let's from a, you know, from an overview, 30,000 foot view, talk about the format of your formula. So the format is the way you bring a story to life. Now, what happens in way too many cases is that we start by thinking of the format first and we end up thinking, okay, I need a video idea. I need a blog post idea. I need a white paper idea. And we sort of corner ourselves to have to present a story in a specific format. When we do that, we're often forcing a story into a format that doesn't suit it as well as some other format would. So I always encourage people, start with the focus, decide whether you're going to tell a story through the lens of people or history or data or something else, and then figure out which format is best to tell this story. So you mentioned uh, audio. Audio is a, is a, a favorite one of mine too. The, the book actually gives you a mix of ones that are really familiar. So things like audio, writing, video, live video that are probably really familiar to you uh, and some that are going to kind of press you creatively. So thinking about how could I tell this story with a quiz? How could a quiz be a useful way to present this information? Or what about a map? Is there a way to present this as a map that would prove to be useful for our audience? So I like that combination because, again, you thought through some of the focuses, some of the ways you might approach the story. And then you're asking, okay, now how could I possibly bring that story to life? And it becomes a lot more interesting because you're coming up with combinations you might not have thought of otherwise. Yeah, and that's the goal here. The goal is not to write content or create content that is appealing to you. The goal here is to create content that is appealing and magnetic to the people that you want to contact you and give you money. That's the goal, period. And it's important because... We recognize for ourselves in our own lives that the way we reach people within our lives are very different. So imagine it's a, it's a pre-COVID, pre-COVID or post-COVID world. You're throwing a get-together at your house. You know there are some people who are only going to show up if you call them on the phone and tell them to come. Other people in your life, you're going to have to send them a Facebook invite or a Google Calendar invite or a text message or some sort of fancy e-card that opens up on screen and confetti pops out, right? We know that different people in our lives 
are best reached in different ways, different tone, different medium. So we want to think of our audience the same way. If we are out here only producing written blog posts on our website and our audience happens to be visual learners, we're really missing a big chance to connect with them. So by working through these different options, we can access people who respond to different types of information like data versus a personal story. And we can access people who process information in different ways, people who are visual learners, auditory learners, who want to engage by doing something and some sort of you know, physical action is going to be the best way for them to learn. So offering these different options is a really good way to ensure you're not missing out on audience who came to you and couldn't find the type of information they were looking for. That's good. That's really, really good. Okay, so here's where the Jeopardy music plays in the background. Not really, but get the uh, mental picture, hear it in your mind. This is the rapid fire bullet section of my interview that I do from time to time. I actually did it last week. I don't do it every week. So I'm going to ask you a simple question. I might say a word or read a statement, and then you take a minute or two and give me whatever comes to your mind and you go as deep into it as you want, but you're limited to like two minutes max. So as it deals with your formula, we're going to talk about focus. Again, we don't have time. Literally, even though it's a short book, there's no possibility we could go through this book on the entire show. So we're going to cover a couple snippets here. So as it relates to focus, people, that's the focus. That's one of your sections. People, yeah, exactly. People focus content. And it's the first one we talk about because it's some of the most relatable content uh, that you can possibly create. The idea being, how can I tell this story through the lens of people? So I gave the example before of you have a new product launch coming up. Sure, you could talk about the product, but who are the people involved in that? So maybe you talk to the engineer who helped design it or uh, the folks who helped design the packaging or the beta testers who have already gone through this service or product and seen some benefits from it. Talk to your team about what it means to be launching this brand new thing. You're still talking about your product launch, but you're doing it through the lens of people and perspectives, and that's going to make it so much more relatable for your audience. We go back to the word of storytelling. Every one of these people has a story to tell. This is brilliant, really. I mean, I, uh, I have so much respect that you made something so powerful, so effective, so amazing into such a short book. You know, most people have too much in there, but they have too much filler and stuff. You did a great job with this. Okay, second one is product. Go. Well, we just talked about product, right? Product, obviously, is the stuff that's more focused on what you're selling. Now, important to note here, I know everyone's in a different situation. Use this word interchangeably with service, with offering. If you are building a personal brand, then you qualify as your product. There's a lot of different ways you can approach this here. The idea being, this is content that is trying to convert your audience from audience to customer in some way, or from former customer to new customer, repeat customer, whatever we're asking them to do. Now, by nature, this type of content tends to focus on what it is that we want them to do or buy. It tends to be more branded, and it tends to include an overt call to action download, schedule, add to cart, something of that nature. So this kind of content is really important. But as we just showed in the previous example about people, many of the other types of content you create with other focuses will still be in some way about your product. You're just approaching it from a different perspective. So don't feel like product-focused content is the only place for you to have a sales conversation It's just the only place where you don't have to pretend you're trying to do anything else. You could just talk straight up about what it is you're offering. Okay, here's my last one. And this one is one that I struggle with. Curation, go. Mm, Curation is fun. So the idea with curation is instead of trying to create one giant thing, you actually collect several smaller things and put them together. So one of the best examples of this would be a roundup if you were doing Uh, 10 podcasts to listen to, 14 books to read, three people you need to follow on Instagram, uh, mistakes people make, uh, questions you need to ask. You're just kind of creating a list of items that you are collecting from elsewhere and organizing them along a similar theme. You may already do something like this on your FAQ page or uh, on a resources page, on a recommendations page. Uh, There's a lot of different ways you can approach this. Um, But I also recommend you do it with your own stuff. So our best uh, episodes of the podcast that you may have missed this year, the most read blogs on our our site from this year that you may not have had a chance to read. By doing that, you can curate your own content and resurface some of your best stuff to make sure it's getting the attention it deserves. At the recommendation of a listener, I started doing that with my own shows at the end of my episodes, recommending shows that dovetail nicely with the conversation I had with that day's guest. Okay, quickly, let's move into format. The first bullet is audio, go. Audio, so audio is really fun. 
Uh, we're, we're giving an example of audio here. Now, if you're listening to us, one thing I want to talk about is that I think we sometimes think that podcast and audio are synonymous, that the only way for us to produce audio content is to have a never ending recurring regular show. And there are a lot of other ways you can use audio uh, to connect with your audience. So one type I like is environmental audio, and that's where you share the sound of a place or a process uh, to help transform people. So me personally, I love the sound of a coffee shop. That is like the ideal background noise for me to get work done. Uh, so if a coffee company were to share something like that, there's a, a tool called Coffitivity that offers just exactly that service. That's a way to transport your audience through audio, but not a recurring show. You could also create audio alternatives of things you're already doing. For example, let the audience listen to an article that you wrote on your website, not just read through it, give them the option to listen to that article. You can create a full feature length uh, audio book of some kind of, of some production you've made. And you can also use audio as a way to troubleshoot different sounds. Uh, my favorite example of this is uh, everyone has felt foolish going to a repairman of, uh, of some kind and having to imitate a sound that some uh, piece of equipment made and we all sound foolish and it's never quite right. Uh, imagine if you could offer your audience a list of clips and say, well, did it sound more like A or B? Okay, B is probably this particular repair and we'll bring the right equipment and we'll come out and fix it for you. So there's a lot of ways you can use audio. Don't feel like you have to create a, a daily or weekly interview show if that's not something that would work for you and your resources. Video versus live video, go. So there's two different formats here. I really encourage people to think of them differently that, you know, standard video, which tends to be produced ahead of time and edited and pre recorded, uh, we expect a more polished experience. And that's wonderful. It produces high quality stuff. But live video does allow us to have a more casual conversation. Uh, to interact with our audience in real time and to document something as it's happening. So think about which of those two would better serve your audience when you're creating video content. And then my last question in the rapid fire bullet section, quizzes, go. Oh my gosh, quizzes are the best. I think people get really intimidated by the idea of a quiz um, for a couple of reasons. They think they don't have the technology. And to that, I remind you that the most famous version of quizzes is those inside the pages of Cosmo, which are merely text turned upside down for an answer key. So you can handle that, you can make a quiz. Uh, and folks also think that, uh, that maybe they're not really sure how to use a quiz, right? Like this is just too fancy. I'm not sure what, what purpose it would serve. So two things to consider. One is testing your audience's knowledge. See how well they understand a process, a product, a need that they have. Uh, and then you can recommend uh, additional, additional content that you've created to fill that knowledge gap. If they didn't understand something, they got a question wrong, check out this episode or this blog post or this video that gives you the correct information. The other thing is to place them into buckets. So maybe you have them answer a set of questions and you tell them which product or service is the best fit based on their needs, or you place them into some kind of category that maybe they're an expert or a newbie or a intermediate level of, of whatever it is that you're testing. Uh, and again, you can serve up content or experiences or products that are a good fit given their responses. So Quizzes are engaging, they're fun, and I think they're surprising to a lot of people. So definitely see if there's a way you can create some kind of quiz for your audience. So here's the last question, and then we're going to talk about your business, how people can you know, find out more about you, how they can get your book. What's the one question today, Melanie, that I didn't ask that I should have asked you? Maybe who the book is not for. I think people always you know, want to know who the book is for, and that's anyone who, who creates content. But it's not for you if you are, have your heart set on creating only one type of content and you're not looking to branch out. If you feel like I'm, I'm just going to create my podcast or my blog post every day and I don't want to deviate from that, uh, then it's probably not going to be a good fit for you. The other thing is if you don't have uh, the desire to create content, if you're not wanting to create more content, not wanting to, to do more of this kind of work, then you will probably find it overwhelming instead of helpful. So you're better off waiting until you are ready to make that, make that leap, make that jump, do something exciting with your content. That would be the best time for you to do it. But until you get to that point, um, I would rather have you work on, work on yourself, work on your inner stuff, work on the resources that you need to do your best work. And then once you're ready, I uh, would love for, for the book to be a tool to help you get there. Okay, so tell us about your business. First of all, do you want us to buy the book on Amazon or from your website, or does it matter? And then secondly, tell us about your website, your business, things you do for clients. Take, take all the time you need. All right, so on my website, storyfuel.co, 
Uh, you'll see a tab for the book. You can also go straight to contentfuelframework.com. That will take you to that same page. Um, there are a limited number of signed copies, which you could buy through the book if you're interested in that. Uh, but if not, feel free to buy it wherever it suits you on Amazon, uh, on Kindle. The audiobook will be coming out very, very soon. It's in review, so any day now. Uh, and then uh, you can also get it at, at Barnes and Noble and a number of other uh, online online folks. So if you if you search those places where you get your books, you should be able to find it. Uh, whatever suits you best is is what I recommend. Um, we are an organization, Story Fuel, that helps people tell better stories. So if you need some help, if you know we give you the guide in the form of the book, and you're like, I still don't know where to start, what actions to take, we may be able to help you with that. We can help you come up with a strategy. We can help train your team to use this system or another system to help make this whole process more efficient. And we can help you figure out where you should and shouldn't spend your attention with the content you are creating to help you get those customers and get the deeper engagement you're looking for. If you're looking to work just directly with me, feel free to check out my website. There's ways you could set up a one-on-one call. We'd be happy to brainstorm with you if that would be of interest. Uh, And there's also a companion workbook that goes with the book. So again, on the website, storeoffuel.co or straight to contentfuelframework.com, you'll see there's a section for a workbook. It's essentially like a fill in the blank prompt thing that will walk you through uh, a thousand plus ideas that you can create for your brand specifically. So please feel free to, to find me, Melanie Diesel, across social, wherever you hang out. I would love to see the stories you tell and let me know how we can be helpful in, in telling all the kinds of stories you want to bring to life. That was amazing. And you are the person who's who narrated the book, correct? The audio? I did. Yeah. So I can tell you that it is a quick read. <laughs> and I can tell you that it's going to be good, man. You are really, really good. You gave us a great, great. Inter- you are a great interview. You are really, really. I've interviewed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. Jonah Berger, Bob Burke. I mean, tons of really well-known people. You, you're going to do what well, you already are doing phenomenal. You have a very, very bright future, young lady. I have to tell you that. But listen, it's been awesome having you on the show today. And uh, just want to thanks. And maybe somewhere down the road, we can have you back on. That sounds good. Thanks for having me and letting me share my story. Now, as I mentioned during my conversation today with Melanie Diesel, having a system in place that allows you to create quality content consistently is mandatory if you want to get clients now and grow your business. Your ability to create and distribute quality content, content your perfect prospects and clients have a ravenous appetite for, requires that you have a system in place. And during the course of my conversation today with Diesel, you learned about a content marketing system you can use to generate fresh and exciting content consistently, easily, and effortlessly. You learned how to create content the marketplace will absolutely love. You learned that having a content creation system in place is necessary to your content marketing success. And over the last four years, we've had several conversations about how you can use content marketing to get clients now, increase sales, and grow your business. A great episode that comes to mind is episode 369, and the title of that episode is Could a New Content Marketing System Created by Pamela Wilson, the former editor of Copyblogger, Really Be This Effective and Work This Fast? Episode 369 is a wonderful place for you to go next, and if that's of interest for you also, you heard Diesel talk today about the importance of having a content marketing system in your business. If you'd like to discover an additional and effective content marketing system you can use to get clients now, Episode number 372, the title of that is, Finally, you can end the frustration and start using content marketing to consistently attract qualified prospects into your business. Again, former manager of copyblogger.com and author Pamela Wilson revealed her revenue-generating masterpiece, also a great place for you to start. In that episode, we talked about several content marketing strategies you can use to generate immediate sales and create instant income in your business. Episode 372, of course, a great place for you to go also. And then finally, I'd recommend episode number 362, where social media marketing expert Mitch Jackson revealed the social media strategies he used to, listen to this, he used to go from practicing law from the trunk of his car to becoming one of America's leading trial attorneys. You know, the basis of Jackson's success on social media lies in his ability to create amazing, compelling content consistently And in this particular episode, he walks us through three key ways to do that, especially right now during times of economic uncertainty. And again, that's episode 362. You can find all those episodes on the KenNewhouse.com website. And what I want to suggest to you next is this. If you want to set up your free membership at KenNewhouse.com, listen to next week's episode because at the conclusion of that show, I'm going to announce the launch date. We're going to be able to sign up for the free membership. Now, if you're wondering why I'm having a launch date where you can actually sign up for the free membership, Let me remind you, 
When you become a member on KenNewhouse.com, you'll have instant access to my own personal library, the book notes, and the highlights that I've captured from that week's guest and their book. You'll also have access to the other books that I've featured on the show for the last few years, plus access to a weekly strategy guide that'll come into your inbox every Wednesday. The guide will feature all the links we mention on every show that links to books, resources, also other podcast episodes, as well as the most effective strategy we covered on that week's episode. Additionally, the guide is going to contain other articles online that I found that I think will be useful for you as well. So be sure to listen for the announcement when we launch the new free membership portal we're creating for you on KenNewhouse.com at the conclusion of next week's episode. And in addition to all that I mentioned, remember, this is why you want to listen especially to next week's episode is that the first 100 subscribers are going to get a free digital copy of the updated version of my book, Profitable Again, as well as a copy of my newest book, Profitable Podcast Blueprint. If you've ever thought about starting a podcast for your business and you're unsure about how to monetize it, the Profitable Podcast Blueprint is literally a blueprint that shows you how to use a podcast to bring high-value clients into your core business consistently. And speaking of incredible content like I've got on KenNewhouse.com, next week I'm having a conversation with Joe Palizzi, CEO of the Content Marketing Institute and author of the runaway bestseller, Content Inc., with the new and updated version of that book coming out in a matter of weeks this spring. As you'll discover during my conversation with Palizzi next week, Palizzi is going to reveal a new model for entrepreneurial success. Simply put, his model is about developing valuable content, building an audience around that content, and then creating a product for that particular audience. Notice the shift. So in next week's show, Palizzi is going to reveal how to flip the traditional entrepreneurial approach of first creating a product and then trying to find customers. He's going to flip that whole thing on its head. He's also going to reveal his six-step business building process that is smart, simple, practical, and cost-effective. And best of all, it works. It's a strategy that Palizzi used to build his own successful company, Content Marketing Institute, which has landed on Inc. Magazine's list of fastest-growing private companies. Listen to this. Not one year, not two years, but three consecutive years. It's also a strategy that countless other entrepreneurs have used to build their own multi-million dollar companies. So, Build an audience, and you'll be able to sell pretty much anything you want. So join me for a conversation next week with my guest, Joe Palizzi, where we discuss the amazing content creation framework he's created and how you can use this powerful tool to get clients now and make your business more profitable than ever in 2021. Have a great week, and I'll see you on the show. Our objective with this podcast is to help you and your business stand out in the marketplace by crystallizing your messaging, marketing, and communications. On behalf of the whole Ken Newhouse team, thanks for listening.